Hi everybody. Today I'm going to play a game of Atlantic Fleet 2016 by Killerfish Games. It's a pretty fun game I've had on my Steam account for a while, and I've definitely gotten my money's worth out of it. The campaign game reminds me a little bit of War at Sea, which is one of my favorite tabletop games of all time by Avalon Hill. But a video game sea battle now and then is okay too, I guess if you don't have a human opponent available to play a board game with you, I suppose. So I'm going to play the British side here against the computer, but I'm going to handicap myself, and I'll explain why in a bit. But a lot of the historical accounts will mention that Langsdorff had the tactical advantage on paper because he was sailing a tougher ship with bigger guns. So what went wrong? I guess that, that's the question. What could have been done differently to save the Graspy from destruction? Well, with this playthrough video, I'm going to attempt to argue that really he nothing like after he made the fateful decision i think to turn and engage the exeter it was by far the most important error in judgment of the entire engagement on either side in my opinion a lot of accounts mention that you know well his spotting craft aircraft was wasn't working so he thought the Achilles and Ajax were actually destroyers and he didn't realize until it was too late so that accounts for his lapse in judgment. I'm gonna argue that even still I'm gonna even give the the Germans the benefit of the doubt here I'll swap out the light cruisers and replace them with two destroyers. I, I still say it was a bad idea um, I did some research too on, on which destroyers actually specifically were in that area and may have um, been actually involved in a, in a fight with the Grasby at that time had had he run into them. And I found they were among them were one called the Hero, one called the Hardy, and one called the Hasty. So I'm going to add two of those guys and take out the, the light cruisers. And we'll see if it makes a difference. I'm guessing, honestly, I'm guessing it won't. And I, I don't really agree with the scoring system, too, in this scenario. Because really, for the Germans to come out with a favorable outcome, he would have to dispose of all three of my ships without taking anything more than light damage. Um, I say anything more than medium damage or medium damage would land him in a neutral port. For sure. Um, so uh, we'll use those criteria for, for victory. Ooh, wow. Missed there with that solo. But actually, in this game, if you get those type of near misses, it as in real life they it causes damage in real life like massive splinter damage took a huge toll on the exeter but yeah all that all that those little things that can can go wrong i guess langsdorf we can say didn't believe in murphy's law just overconfident i think he, he just maybe couldn't believe that uh Six inch guns could, you know, punch holes in the side of the ship, I guess. Or maybe he did know that and just thought he could he could finish this thing off faster than uh, than the British could ever imagine. But um if you think about it, what kind of a what kind of the gamble is that, honestly? You're betting your life that the Germans or his his gun crews can outgun, outshoot the Royal Navy. Come on. Like the Royal Navy doesn't know what they're doing. They the the their crew are a bunch of bums. Okay. <laughs> Extremely highly motivated professional sailors from what I can determine just from reading the historical accounts of the battle. So one one thing I noticed 
already. Yeah, I'm going to lay some smoke here with one of the destroys. They're just going to rush full speed. They're up to 33 knots already. Uh, headed straight at the at the Commerce Raider. He's missing. It's hard to find range. I'm like, I mean, probably being a bit more aggressive with Exeter than what Harwood was. I don't think he charged head on. I'm steaming full speed. Well, trying to get up to full speed here, 30 knots. Oh, and one thing in the report too that I found interesting is Harwood estimated that the grass speed never at any time got above 24 knots. He chose to be, ooh, there we go. I'll, t I'll take it. First hit with an 8-inch gun. He chose to be like very cagey and like zigzag all around, be erratic, which bled speed off. Um, I don't think that was you can criticize not criticize him for doing that. I, I mean, he's he's trying to land hits, not run at this point. But it is different from from what we're seeing here because he's the ship's moving a lot faster than what apparently Langsdorf tried to do. Uh, the small guns on the destroyers are incredibly hard, I find, to aim and land hits at range, especially with crappy windage. Uh, so he's going to show a broadside here, bring both the, big, the turrets to bear on them. This is where it gets really dangerous. You know? <laughs> That wrecked my steering, it looks like. Hurt my speed as well. Direct hit. How many more of those can I take? Not many. It looks like I got a list, too. To starboard. Yeah, Exeter took some serious punishment in real life. Missed. Grass speed's showing damage, though, now. Full steam ahead with the destroyers. One thing I have to mention, you guys, uh, it's really fascinating to read Harwood's document because he's got all the all the casualties by name of the crew, and it's really compelling uh, reading to because uh, it, there's a section right at the start of the document where it says the names of all the sailors that were killed, and then. There's a section that says, uh, like, all the, um, basically, medals and awards for bravery, and it gives, like, certain accounts of, uh, basically, conspicuous gallantry. That's what uh, the medals were, like, some of the highest uh, accommodations given. And I want to read a couple right before I, uh, I close off the video, because it's just astounding the individual acts of bravery that were recorded by Harwood. These occurred mainly on the Exeter after it was hit and both turrets were knocked out on the front, resulting in a, like an extreme loss of life. I, my ship looks not great shape here. I've been taking... There we go. That's a big hit on the on the grass be there got some fire critical hit it looks like on the front turret as well could have happened in real life that's the thing I mean like it's just a very dangerous game to be to be playing for Langsdorf so far away from home by himself no support it is so he's got raging fires now oh he's using did that come from his secondary secondary guns fires under control there 
now. Really closing fast. I don't want to present a broadside with the Exeter. It's not that durable a ship, and then I, I don't want to present like a, a too large of a profile. I'd rather just go straight at him. Um, another thing Harwood says in his, I thought it was interesting. He kind of criticizes the overall design of the Spee, saying like the huge tower was just so simple to see, like silhouetted, silhouetted against the horizon. He said they had absolutely no problem ever spotting it, despite how much like smoke screens the, oh, there we go. The, uh, the German crews tried to lay during the entire engagement. What we're seeing here too, it doesn't really resemble what happened to like historically, because Harwood also mentions, and the only other sort of big criticism he he kind of uh, makes note of is he said that the throughout the battle, Spee's like secondary guns were trying to fire as well, and he said they were like remarkably ineffective and wildly inaccurate. They would, he said, they didn't worry about them at all. It was all the the big 11 inch guns caused all the problems for the British. He said that they were accurate fire throughout, although not quite as um, high rate of fire as he would have anticipated. He said the, the salvos from the Germans came fairly slow. Um, i trying to think of, I'm trying to remember all the other interesting details I picked up in that document that I hadn't seen in other sort of more con oh there we go he lit one of my destroyers on fire here that's not good and I'm outside of maximum torpedo range I think or if I did fire it would be sort of a more Hail Mary type of move with the there we go oh <laughs> yeah see that's right there that that's that makes this whole thing not worth it for Langsdorf if this is the the real sort of stuff that could happen. He's already all lit up on fire. His front turret is wrecked too. That hasn't fired since the first two or three salvos. It looks like yeah, it's not working. He's laying smoke like he did in real life, zigzagging back and forth. Uh, now I'm going to try and uh, I'll get a free shot here until he decides to engage the uh, the destroyers as they close in for a torpedo strike. He's not done yet. They, the computer always plays this way. They'll lay smoke and then as soon as uh, I do this <laughs> he'll be he'll be engaging the the destroyer. There's there's no doubt whether it's with his uh, remaining turret or whatever. One criticism of the game, I think it's probably it's probably too easy to land successful torpedo strikes. There are dead torpedoes, for sure, but they probably don't occur in-game as much as uh, they occurred in real life, I'm guessing. Let's see what I can do here. Usually try and break up my uh, what I carry in two salvos. You can get a ship at two different angles. It kind of helps and limits their options. Oh, this reminds me one other like really interesting detail in Harwood's document is, um, and I ne I've never seen this actually in any other, you know, historical treatment of this. So Harwood says that at some point after the Exeter was hit hard and the front turrets were knocked out of action, they did a... Uh, 
sort of a low percentage spread of torpedoes. And for Harwood, he said that that represented a turning point in the battle for him, from his point of view, because after those were on their way headed towards the Spee, it got a strong reaction out of Langsdorf, like he took strong evasive maneuvers, laid smoke, and Harvard says that after that exact moment, it seemed to change something in Langsdorf, like he became more timid and less... Um, sort of decisive in his actions. And for Harwood, he said the, the greatest danger of the battle seemed to have passed at that moment because everything after that was sort of more sporadic and the actions taken by Langsdorf and the speed seemed less decisive and potentially dangerous. That was an interesting perspective I hadn't read before. I was like, oh, okay. Not like, you know, the Spee hadn't done significant damage to the British at that point, but I'm just saying, like that, to me, I had never heard um, that the British torpedoes had that kind of psychological impact on on Langsdorf. You know, that's according to to Harwood. So that was a, a, an enlightening sort of aspect of it. But I have the, the Spee on the ropes here. It has to dodge a bunch of torpedoes now. I have another destroyer right behind the first one. I have the ability to touch it up with the 8-inch guns. It's just, you know, and I, I keep in mind I deleted two light cruisers and replaced them with these tin pot destroyers. And look at the damage. I've, I've hit them with... Uh, with the tor torpedo now, and he's on fire in three different places. He is still faster than I th thought he was. Even faster than the damage Exeter, I think. Otherwise, he wouldn't be using smoke. The computer will stop with the smoke if it has no way to to retreat, no chance of retreating. It'll go back to using its guns. I, just by looking at it, though, it doesn't look very seaworthy anymore. I've got the hero closing in. It's still a bit too far out to launch torpedoes. Let's see if I can get out of the rest of the guns. <laughs> There's his secondary armament hitting the engaging the destroyers. Missed with some torpedoes. What else is new? In this game too, I like to use high explosive shells on a target that's burning. Because I always imagine, you know, you have to have people fighting fires on the deck. And so it's probably more effective to use high explosive ammo to try and sort of pour fuel on the fire, so to speak. Another thing I'll um, I'll say is like the only World War II era ship I've been on was it was a destroyer called the Haida, and it used to be parked in Toronto at um, Ontario Place. And as a small kid, I got to crawl all around the ship. And man, the one thing that the impression it left on me was this thing is really big <laughs> and I just couldn't imagine if 
that's just to me the Haida was like a, a pretty damn large ship. Um, imagine what one of these things would be like. Oh my gosh! Oh, there we go. That's it. Yeah. Found a destroyer. Not much I could do. It did its. I mean, that's an acceptable trade, though. It would have been in real life as well. There's other British ships there. Like, they could have picked up the survivors. So, yeah, take a, uh, huge balls to close in on a bigger ship with big guns. But when you have numbers, it makes all the difference, I would say. There's more hits there. Um, immediate effect to drop the, the bow of the ship. Almost there with the hero. Big fire burning aft of the speed. It's a lost cause. You can see how quickly everything went south for the Germans. There was a secondary explosion there. Just you just couldn't have anything bad happen, and it's so pie in the sky to think that Langsdorf, like if it would, the ship was commanded by someone else, you know, they would have gotten a better result. I don't think so. And they always, stories about this battle, they always mention the fact that, you know, he had uh, the Exeter damaged, why didn't he finish it off? And, well, to be honest, that wasn't like him to do something like that the one thing like I mean you could call him a pirate if you want as a commerce raider but he certainly was not a bloodthirsty one and yeah it, that didn't seem like it, it was in his makeup because even when you uh, read about oh there's another huge explosion on the speed on the commerce Raiders, like he picked up all survivors. There was no loss of life on the ships that he sank. So, and that, and it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. Had he done that, if the if the Exeter wasn't didn't pose any further threat to him, like it did in real life, then like I mean, why finish it off? Like what? It doesn't matter at that point. It's just. A wasting more ammo. I guess it sort of feeds into what I said earlier. The big mistake was initiating the in, the engagement to begin with. Everything else after that is academic. What difference does it make, honestly? What difference did it make if he finished all three of the British ships off, considering the damage he took? Either way, it was the end of his combat patrol and his ship because there's just no way to get it home and also too like you he has to worry about real human lives and sparing them you know like you don't have to in video games and this is another oh there's my other destroyer now this is actually dangerous uh the exeter doesn't get free shots anymore he's going to be shooting at me so this is a, a very dangerous part of the of the battle here as long as he's got a functioning turret and i missed that's not good but yeah, what I was saying is, uh, yeah, there's in this game there's no concept of morale or the human toll that was. Oh, it's sinking. It's gone. I won. 
the Battle of the Atlantic took. It was just, it's just staggering. It's mind blowing. And anyway, I'll just, uh, yeah, it was a big loss there, as I expected. I want to close with uh, reading a description that's found in Admiral Harwood's official report. And this lists an example of conspicuous gallantry aboard the HMS Exeter. And listen to this account. It's just unreal. So this refers to um, a British sailor named Wilfred A. Russell, Royal Marines, HMS Exeter. And it says, who having his left forearm blown away and his right arm shattered when a turret was put out of action by a direct hit from an 11 inch shell, refused all but first aid, remained on deck and went about cheering on his shipmates and putting courage into them by his great fortitude and did not give in until the heat of the battle was over. He has since died of his wounds. And then it was referring to, it must have been referring to another man listed lower on this honor roll. And I believe his name was W.G. Gilliam. So he was one of the guys that Russell, I guess, was cheering on. And it says, who helped midshipman Cameron to smother the flames of a burning ammunition locker and to throw hot shells with their brass cases, either missing or split open over the side. He showed no regard for his own safety in putting out fires on the upper deck near the aircraft from which petrol was leaking. And it just goes on and on in this document. And it just, it's just so insane to take in all of these examples of extreme heroism. Like there's probably four or five guys that single-handedly saved the Exeter from blowing up and sinking. And, I, you know, you don't usually get that unless you turn to the primary documents. And there was another example of a guy, I think he was on the Ajax, and it described how he was... Uh, working near the spotting plane catapult and it took a hit and his clothes were soaked through with aviation fuel because it sprayed all over him and he remained topside to fight fires the whole time his clothes were soaked through with gasoline I mean come on it's just it's just crazy and who knows what other comparable examples of heroism occurred on the German side, right? You, we don't, we don't know that. But anyway, um, thanks for watching, and I might, might try a few more what if scenarios. This is a really fun game, actually. I really recommend it uh, if you're interested in any type of naval combat game. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more content coming soon.